Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Victoria Iverson and I work in the office of the president of ETH Zurich. It's my pleasure to be here and moderate a global lecture for the very first time. Um, who else is here for the first time? Is this your first global lecture? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that makes me feel so much better. I thank you so much. Um, well, welcome to all of you. Um, if you have been here before, welcome back. Um, to those of you who are new, let me tell you a few words about the Global Lecture Series. Um, the idea is to offer a platform for contemporary global topics to be discussed with outstanding global thinkers. And in other words, we bring amazing people here um, to discuss their personal experiences and special insights and you, of course, have an opportunity to interact with them. And we hope you leave here tonight with more questions than you got answers for, new ideas, and things that you'll continue the conversation on, whether it be with your colleagues, with your friends, or with your family. Um, a few words on how the session is going to run. Um, I'm going to invite our distinguished um, guest speakers to come onto the stage in a minute, and they will present first, um, after which we'll be joined by our ETH speaker to continue the conversation in a panel format. And we'll then open it up to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, please make a note of it, save it for later, and I promise, I promise we will have time to go through your questions later on. Um, so that's the housekeeping bit out of the way. Um, let's get to the content of today's lecture. Um, we are invited today to go below with two inspiring guests who will tell us about their National Geographic assignment, Exploring Our Seas. And before I introduce them, I need to give you a bit of context so you understand why they're here today. Um, who has visited or happened to visit the wonderful photo exhibit that's on in town at this very moment? It's called Open Your Eyes. Does that ring a bell? If you haven't had a chance, you really must have a look. It's um, all around um, the city of Zurich, and um, there are stations each focusing on one of the UN SDGs, the so-called Sustainable Development Goals. And it feels very relevant to be talking about the SDGs today given that it's the week of the UN General Assembly, as you all will have seen and heard of in the news. Our speaker's work is featured in the station for SDG 14, which is called Life Below Water. And so, here to tell us about how they spend their life below water are journalist, artist, and explorer David Dubile, and scientist turned storyteller Jennifer Hayes. David, Jennifer, the underwater floor is yours. So, hello, good people. Hello, ETH. Hello, hello Zurich. ETH. So, you could be anywhere, and you are here, so thank you for coming. Uh, we are going to take you on assignment and on projects with us. David and I are our married couple who co-produce stories for National Geographic magazine. We are together 24-7, above and below people. <laughs> yeah, a lot of yikes. There's one of you in the audience who has seen what that's like. I won't point him out, but if he wants to know, he's there. His name's Fabian. He's been on a journey with us to Indonesia. Thank you for coming, Fabian. Don't share any secrets, please. Um, <laughs> So, what we're here to do, and it's a little, I'm a little wobbly, David, yeah. to be back in a classroom. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm not kidding. I used to teach at a university, so when I see all of you, I wonder what I haven't done. Um, so, we're going to take you with us. Just come with us, submerge with us, and at some point, we're going to, we're going to, before I forget, just say this. If you guys have questions, and we don't get to them, stalk us. Yeah. Putting that right out front. This is all about you. The stories are not about us, it's about getting emerging storyteller, scientists, OSHA, people emerging and getting them where they need to be. So stalk us, but let's get started. 
and we're going to drag you right into our most recent story. This is called ReShark. It published in First and Digital at National Geographic. It was an exclusive Nat Geo story given to them by the Seattle Aquarium, and it dropped. They call it dropping in March, and then print went in July in the ocean issue that drops in June. So. Everyone, please meet, this is Claudia. This is a zebra shark. Why is she so important? There is a new program, brand spanking new, that began Friday, January the 13th in Raja Ampat, Indonesia, the center of the Center of Marine Biodiversity. And what they are doing is this simple for shark conservation. This simple, wait for it, putting sharks back. That's the key to this whole thing. So to do this, we use aquariums. Uh, Mark, Dr. Mark Erdman had the bright idea when he saw shark eggs, an abundance of, and he had an MPA that all the sharks had been fished out. He put the two together in his mind. He went around, he got 75 partners, 44 aquariums in 15 countries to participate. And this is one of the participant, participants at the Chicago Shed Aquarium. So here we go, we're gonna meet. Now this shark is Cleo. And that is Seymour behind her, asking her for a hot date. Cleo, would you like to mate? Cleo says, no, not in the mood, Seymour. Why is she not in the mood? Well, it turns out Cleo actually is bearing an egg. There she is, she's looking at this, this lyre coral, thinking maybe I'll leave my egg here. You can see the tendrils coming out of her cloaca there, her vent, but she drops it here. Here's where her egg is now. The divers in the aquarium take that egg with the embryo, and there is a zebra shark embryo, alive and well. They take it upstairs and they rear it, but it will go here to Indonesia as an embryo and go into a shark nursery. This is Papua diving. The egg hatches and meet, this is Molly. Look at how different she looks than her parents. And then they graduate from the blue tanks to a sea pen. They learn how to eat. And then they, once the scientists learn, there are shark nannies that are with them 24 seven. And once they know that the sharks are big enough, healthy enough, can sustain their own, so they learn how to forage. This is Caitlin learning. She's pre presenting her snail. See, I'm learning this. I'm learning how to be a zebra shark. And then, once they're ready, they are driven by boat four hours to a marine protected area called Wayag in northern Raja Ampat. Now, there I said three words in there that are key to this whole thing. Marine protected area. That means that when these sharks go back, they're not going to be fished out like they were. Historically, there was no marine protected area in that, in that region, and now when the sharks go back, they are protected from fishing and harvest, and they are tagged, and we know their locations, and they can actually, the scientist, this is Nesha Ashida, an Indonesian who keeps track of them. What's the good news here? 500 sharks are going back into this marine protected area, but it doesn't stop with zebra sharks. They're gonna go on down the species list and put what they can involving the aquariums, who has what, who has the different species, and it's just having to start with zebra sharks. So here's January, this is Friday the 13th, and there goes Caitlin, the first shark. Over 350 Indonesian dignitaries there in this remote island, so they are embracing it. That is good because it is community based conservation. It's not about us bringing it to them, it's about their ownership. And that's why it's going to work so well. That and that in looking at the species list. David, you take control. Arthur Clark said once, and this is a very key thing, 1971. He said, "How inappropriate to call our planet Earth when it is clearly ocean. <laughs> the most powerful animal." on our planet is the size of a child's pinky fingernail, and that is the coral polyp. And the coral polyp produces things like this, the Great Barrier Reef. The coral polyp depends on the food it eats from its tiny little mouths, and it also depends on algae within its tissues. 
and the algae, of course, receives sunlight and therefore powers the coral. But if the temperature rises, the temperature rises, this algae abandons the coral, or the coral actually expels it, and the coral begins to bleach. This is what a coral reef looks like. This is opal reef in 2009. It is absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Opal reef between 2009 and 2018 had back-to-back -back bleaching episodes. In other words, the temperature rises, the sea temperature rises, the coral expels the algae, the algae turns white, coral dies. Sometimes it can recover, but if it's back-to-back, -back, as our planet is changing, this is Opal Reef in 2018. Same exact coral head. We went back because we're working on a story on a project called Coral Through the Lens of Time. And it depends on an archive that we have, an archive that I've photographed and made images for, for the National Geographic for the last, well, 50 years. This is obviously not that old, but this is an archive that can tell us how our planet is changing and how our seas are changing. So what do you do with two million slides or two million frames? David, when, when did you first submerge, David? Ish. Ish. Lincoln was alive. Lincoln was alive. Right. When and, was and, that? Uh, snorkeling. When was it? So S it has to be 1958. So but the I mean, 70s. 70s yeah, you were on reefs. So yeah. what we're doing is we're going back to these places and taking what was with us, we're blowing them up, we're submerging these images, and looking at before and now, you know, then, then and now, and then and now. And we're seeing some remarkable, it's a story that started with just this, but now it continues on with everything, from kelp to coral to you name it. We're going back and looking through the lens of time. And in here, we can actually see the reef in, two, it, in real time and historical. And David's holding, literally holding, a 2009 photograph of the same coral head. And on the right side, you see it in 2018 after back-to-back -back bleaching. And let's not stop at back-to-back -back bleaching, because here we are in 2023. So we have back-to-back-to-back-to-back bleaching. You see, coral reefs in this situation can be and are thermometer that can tell the health of our planet and how it's changing. Is everybody depressed yet? Anyone? Anybody who feels like overly depressed, raise your hand. Not too bad. There's still some half, half full cups out there. But right next to that dead reef in some of these areas, we have survivor reef. Small patches, small resilient patches. Some scientists want to call it super coral. And we all kind of I don't know if we like that name. Let's just call it survivor coral because it survived. And there's a lot of reasons why. Dave, you, one that David talks about is nearby upwelling, deep water upwelling that's cooler and it allows that coral a little bit more of a thorm thermal tolerance. Others is genetics. But this survivor coral, there are scientists out here, and this is where the real hope comes from, scientists, and why we're talking here. Again, I'm a little wobbly coming back into a university because you guys are all terrifying to me a little bit, but I hate to say it, that you guys, the reason we're here is you're part of this solution. You're the next generation that's gonna inherit this and with the problem solving that comes with. We're gonna put you on our shoulders and try and get you as far as we can. Scientists like Peter Harrison, we embed with the scientists now. We just don't go out and make these horrible pictures and say we're all doom and gloom and it's all over people. We embed with the scientists because that's where the solutions are. Peter Harrison is, is actually using these resilient corals. They do spawn. He harvests their reproduction. And like a farmer, he puts it back over the devastated areas on the coral reef. And the really cool news is that it's not just a patch. It's not like plunking down one little piece of coral at a time, which is called outplanting. This type of coral is broadcast cor coral, or is coral spawning to scale. And you need scale when you start talking about the Great Barrier Reef. 
Let's get a glimpse of what hope looks like because of scientists like Peter Harrison, and we're trying to Svengali all the next generation into entering any type of solution, problem solving you can. But let's take a look. This is coral spawn. This is what it looks like when resilient coral spawns. David, you want to tell them what it's like to be on a reef? It is, well, think about it. It is maybe the greatest sex act on our planet in one night. And it was discovered by Peter Harrison a little more than 30 years ago. This extraordinary animal, this powerful animal on the Earth, the only animal that can be seen from space, spawns in one night. These are the great plate corals of Moore Reef. We didn't know whether it would spawn on a hottest, hottest day that Queensland ever had in its history. It spawned. And this is what happened. And this is what it looks like. And here's Peter's program, and he's one of many, not him alone, but many, many scientists, and we are working towards going out and submerging with as many as we can. Here's one solution. And make that one half now, over half of the GBR. So dead coral. And coral that survived the bleaching. And coral that didn't. Survivor coral. And things that survive on coral. Farmers, they seed the, the reef that's been decimated. And then in 24 hours, they pick up these blankets and new growth happens in a very short time. So everybody, we can still get out of bed because there are scientists chasing solutions. What is the largest border, the most important border on our planet? It's the surface of the sea, or the surface of the water, that difference between the air world and the water world. I've been working, making these pictures that are half and half out of the water for a number of years, and uh, during COVID, Jennifer and I put together a book called Two Worlds, and this explores this incredible border, molecular thin, dividing the known world, between from the unknown world. Here it is, this border. Let's populate this. There's a kind of a magic making these pictures 
because it's an introduction. It brings people into the sea, opens their eyes. This is in the Cayman Islands. But there's also a magic between that surface alone because during the evening as the electronic flash photographs, it freezes the water into almost crystal. This is a group of sharks hunting, a group of lemon sharks hunting in the Bahamas just before dusk. And sometimes there's another piece of magic. A crocodile in the gardens of the queen in Cuba at night, a dead flat night, and as he swims along, his wake imitates the shape of the crocodile. On a day that was full of rain and kind of gloomy day in Raja Ampat, we found an island. Fishermen were surrounding it and we jumped in and it was a carousel of bait fish swimming around this island, silvery bait fish. And just before, uh, just before we finished shooting, the sun came out, just a little bit of sun on a rainy day. And an image that I dreamed about when I was a child, this is a bergy pit in Danko Island in Antarctica. It's a group of chinstrap and gentoo penguins and they are on top of this bergy bit and they're playing a game called King of the Iceberg. King of the Iceberg, in which they do, they would hit each other with their flippers, knock one off and they would swim underwater, actually fly underwater and pop up on the other side and the games would continue. In a freezing cold sea, this is a, a picture I dreamed about. And of course, icebergs themselves here is a huge one off Greenland. Icebergs are the metaphor for the ocean. The known part, what we know about it, above, below, the unknown, sculptural, mysterious, and most of our planet. And sometimes there's a moment on every story where a picture that's half and half out of the water can tell a tale that brings the whole story together. Like this reef in Kimby Bay that took us a month to find, and when we found it, I was in heaven, little island, beautiful coral, and then a father and son in a, in a uh, canoe came by fishing. There is good news too, another piece of good news, but first a little bit of a bad news. This is me, age 14, in the Caribbean, and those corals in the front, those are elkhorn corals, which used to actually forest the entire Caribbean Sea. Beneath them were just rivers of fish. And for the most part, it is all gone, except for one place, and that place is called the Gardens of the Queen, an archipelago off the south coast of Cuba. Looks like this, discovered by Columbus on his second voyage, protected by a rare combination of geopolitics and geography. The hurricanes bypass them north and south. The geopolitics means that very few divers, uh, tourists, and of course commercial fishermen were there. And of course Fidel Castro was instrumental in protecting this place. It is a place of sharks, of groupers, of a reef, well a reef that is like what it was in the Caribbean a half a century ago. How many of you in here are divers? Anyone? Oh! oh wonderful. Oh my God. Look wonderful. at that. You have to go to Cuba. <laughs> you can. Americans can't. That's one reason you have to go to Cuba. Yeah. Go right now. There. Go now <laughs> before we can go back again. But you're about to see why you should go to Cuba as an example of successful conservation. So David and I were there. All of these pictures you're gonna see or video were made in like eight shooting days. That's nothing. We can be out for a month at a time, or we used to be out for a month at a time. But we're working this entire, there's coral reefs, sand flats, uh, mangroves, and we're working in the mangroves to show the productivity. Everybody loves mangroves because they're, they're stabilizers, they're centers of productivity. The biggest thing they are is nurseries for everything that when you're tiny and teeny and you're gonna get eaten by everything else, you go to the nursery to grow up until you aren't gonna be eaten by somebody else. And I'm in, I'm in the mangroves, 
mangrove, and I'm looking at all these silver sides, and it was late summer, and the silver sides come in, so you just don't have trees and mangrove roots. You have jellyfish and silver sides, and I'm like photographing this, and I'm, my back is to David, and then I hear this, bum, 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 bum. And that is a signal. When David and I work together and in our, in our environment or a situation changes, we have signals we use underwater. It's either sound or it's a rapid blast of flashes. And that's what I heard, bah, 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 with the flashes and just a really rapid succession of photographs going off in my direction. Jennifer, something has changed. This is what had changed <laughs> in my circumstance. I had a visitor. This is an American crocodile. I talk underwater, I hum underwater, and I, I think I probably attracted him. He came up, hey, what is this? What's going on? Now, in this particular incidence, crocodiles encounter snorkelers and divers. This is not a Nile crocodile, not a saltwater crocodile. But I turned around, I heard David's, I heard David's signal, I turned around, and this was my encounter. Hello, handsome. What are you doing today? And he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. If anybody wants to know what my perspective looked like, this is what I saw. <laughs> I was like, well, look at you. And notice this, though. David warned me, right? But do you notice David also managed to get the photograph? And take the picture. See, that? See how much concentration my hunk of burning love has right there. <laughs> Not only was I warned, Jennifer. but he also <laughs> managed to get a picture. So am I frightened by this? This photograph right now tells a story. And it doesn't tell the story that I'm in danger by this incredible apex predator about to be eaten and a story run in The Guardian about it. I can't tell you how many requests we got for that. The goal of this picture that we have of the crocodile is to signify this ecosystem not only supports a healthy population of sharks, it also supports a very healthy population of reptiles that exist nowhere else in the Caribbean. This is a place that was. This is a museum. And when we get journalistic requests for, we would like to run that picture of the crocodile behind Jennifer in the law review as an advertisement, we pull back on those and let it only go for conservation purposes. You manage the journalism around it so it doesn't sensationalize. You try to control the narrative. But you heard me in, has anybody been to Cuba? Huh? No? Okay. All right. Tell your friends to go. Here's why.
you got to go. <laughs> and your dive buddies, they appear terrifying, but they're not. The crocodiles are used to snorkelers. Uh, going by every day and divers. And again, if this were Niles or saltwater crocodiles, you, we, you would not see any of this happening. The end of February, some of the coldest days of the year, in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, on the open sea ice, arguably the most beautiful animal in the world is born, and that is a harp seal born with a perfect white coat on open sea ice where the wind never stops in this frozen, frozen nursery. And here's what a harp seal nursery looks like. The mothers draw up on the ice and give birth. This is part of a group of 10,000 harp seal mothers giving birth on the open sea ice in the middle of winter in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So what we're gonna do to you right now is draw you right into the middle of a story that's, gonna, that's not published yet. We've been working up in the Gulf since 2011. We go back every year that the ice allows. This brings me to the point to tell you that harp seals are ice obligates. What does that mean? They are obligated to give birth on ice. They cannot give birth on shore. The mother will leave the pup, the pup develops infections, there's predation, wolves and coyotes and humans. It's not a scenario that exists in their, bi their biology. So 2011 till now, ice conditions have been not, they haven't ever been what they were historically. They are either okay, treacherously bad, or the ice doesn't form at all. We started in 2011, we realized that this story we were gonna have to stick with to tell the story of harp seals as a face of climate change, meet the face of climate change. And a good year, and this particular image was made in 2012, which was a decent ice year. What does that mean? That means that some seals survived. How many are we talking about? 100,000-ish. Ish, come into the Gulf. They're an Arctic species that migrate down in November. The, the males and the females come in. The females are pregnant. Along around January, February, about February 25th, they start looking to, for a place to birth in unison. They'll get up on any ice presented to them, even if it's wafer thin. And, if, and as, ice, as temperatures rise in the Gulf, the ice diminishes, and they, like I said, sometimes they're faced with really bad ice, but in, they are so desperate. Imagine being pregnant and not having a place to go. They will choose bad ice. So on the ice, mom's going to come and go. She's had the pup. She's going to come and go 12 to 15 days to nurse her pup. While she's gone, the pup is going to seek just some sort of protection from the relentless wind. That piece of protection can be as big as your shoe, just a wind block, anything to block that wind. And here, this guy has found this really great piece of ice. Now, I am going to bring you into this story because after 12 to 15 days, the mom leaves. She abandons the pup. He's going to rely or she's going to rely on the fat reserves. It builds up. Mom's going to mate and go back. And then the pups are left on the ice to, become, to learn how to become harp seals. First, they're going to rely on those fat reserves, they're gonna realize mom's gone, they're gonna molt, they're gonna have to learn how to swim, they're gonna have to learn how to eat, they're gonna have to learn how to be a harp seal, and in that process, they're gonna need six to eight weeks of ice, at least. And then after that comes the Canadian seal hunt if the ice lasts. The hunt is now a fraction of what it was, so we don't really talk about the hunt anymore because it's climate change. But throughout the years of working up there, David and I have had a lot of encounters with harp seals and different ones that have been life-changing. This is a journalistic moment. I had to make a decision. I was there to make a picture of climate change, and that picture was a dying seal, a dead seal, a pulverized seal, literally death in the ice. I want you to listen to this and listen to the decision I had to make. So right now we're pulling you right smack into the middle of storytelling and decisions you have to make as a storyteller.
Harp seal white coats are an engaging, beautiful animal now facing the ugly truths of climate change. Pups require stable ice to survive and mature on. As temperatures rise, the ice nursery shrinks. Sometimes it collapses, sometimes it doesn't form at all. Can you picture thousands of pregnant seals with no place to give birth? In 2020, limited sea ice formed in the Gulf, but a big storm came through and broke it up. Winds pushed the pieces back into a loose patchwork of ice cover. The harp seal herd, desperate for a birthing platform, hauled out on this fractured world and began giving birth February 29th. Temperatures kept rising and their world kept shrinking. The nursery was disappearing beneath them. This newborn pup, only minutes old, was born on slush, not on sea ice. I returned to find open water and no pup. We saw an exhausted pup drowning in heavy slush and I made the hard decision to get in and document death in a disintegrating world of ice. The pup sensed I was stable and climbed on to rest. I had to make a decision, push the pup off and let it drown or let it stay and swim it out to open water. I began to swim. This is what a disintegrating ice nursery looks like nine days after the herd gave birth. Pups need a few weeks of good ice. Imagine this ice in a storm. Because of COVID, the scientists left the field, but estimate survivorship was somewhere between not good and catastrophic. I wondered then, and I wonder now, did this struggling pup survive? So, historically, you could walk 100 miles or drive your snowmobile 100, 150 miles on the sea ice. And now, in a reasonable year, this is what the seals are faced with and mothers. So we are right in the middle of telling this story. I had to make a decision whether or not to push that seal off and get the photo that I had intended to get. Um, it was struggling. It found me by doing this and crawled up and and began to respond, you know, literally rest on my shoulder, I did swim it out to safety. It is a piece of journalism that I, yeah, it, I had a helicopter pilot next to me saying, are you going to take the shot? So that's something for you guys to think about in our world of climate change and journalism, storytelling, and science. Where are we, where, how do we fit in? So I thank you for coming. It is an absolute pleasure being here and having an audience of great brilliance and wonder. So Thank you. stalk us too, don't be shy. Questions, or if you need assets, if you're on a project, yeah. working on something and it has to do with climate change, maybe we can help, you never know. <laughs>
the day-to-day -day basis of uh, at ETH. But let me start with this picture, um, which is the field side, the only field side. So I studied biology at the University of Zurich, and that's how I became involved, interested in, in marine conservation, marine science, eventually in shark research. So that's the only field site I still continue to go to, get data and publish um, as a hobby, as an independent researcher today. This is Shark Reef Marine Reserve on the southern coast of Viti Lebo, which is the main island of Fiji. And this is, I mean, you said, many of the things you said and, and, and words you used are resonating. Uh, so this is a, a, a conservation project uh, driven by communities in Fiji. And what we did, Next year, 20 years ago, is we sort of bought this reef, this particular reef, which is called Shark Reef, on the old navy charts of the Brits, because probably there's lots of sharks, also in the old days. We bought this from the villages. In Fiji, this is not state-owned, government-owned, but this is really belonging to the villages, which means the fishing rights are belonging to the villages, but that's where the money is or the food is. So we went to the villages that own that reef and we said, we want to have exclusive access to that reef. We want to bring divers, show them the sharks, the beauty of the corals, the reef, everything. And you don't touch it anymore. You don't do fishing, nothing. What you get in exchange is you get cash. We collect the so-called shark levy from each individual diver, which is around 25 Fijian dollars these days, and we give it 100% to the villages. With that money, they can do whatever they want. They can build community places, a church, or whatever they think is in, in, interesting for them or important. Now, what you see when you go underwater is this. This is a bull shark. His name is White Nose. Um, and in addition to that, you see plenty of other species, also sharks. This is a very special place. Um, as a diver, if you dive, and if you don't go to Cuba, but instead to Fiji, and do a dive there and spend 30 minutes on the water. If you're lucky, you can see up to eight species of different sharks, which is amazing. Um, and what's really interesting for me as a scientist uh, is that some of these individuals, like this guy, we know from day one. Um, so we can track it over time using photography, videography, um, and some of these individuals, why do we know them? This particular uh, individual we know because of the white spot you see on the, on the snout. So many of these individuals have, or these bull sharks, have distinct, distinctive marks, deformations, cuts, whatever. And, and using those, uh, we can really track them over time, which gives us a lot of information. So in terms of methodology, we use direct observation, like observing these sharks on a daily basis or on a, on a weekly basis, depending when they're there. And the other, um, the other method we use at, this, at the other end of the spectrum is, is, in this case, satellite telemetry. So we attach devices on shark, electronic tracking. tracking, tracking. So this is a pop-up satellite tag, which is attached to a shark, then it swims off, you, have never, you never see him again. And, <coughs> It stays on for the shark for about six months or eight months and collects data over this time period. Um, when it pops up to the surface, it connects to a satellite and I get the data on my laptop computer. Easy. So this is how we can really look into any, many different aspects of their life. Um, the two questions I have briefly in Fiji and have been following over the years is, one is the life cycle of the bull shark where does it give birth? Where does it reproduce? Where does it feed? Where does it spend its time? And the other one is the influence of, of shark feeding on these individuals. Because you don't get a place on this planet where you see that many sharks, like on the shark reef reserve, without feeding sharks or attracting sharks with food. In this case, this is feeding. Um, why we can use that or why we work together with photographers is because of this. Um, we need high-resolution photography, or we can use high-resolution photography to tell stories about the life cycle or what happens to these uh, individuals. On the left-hand side, you see um, a bull shark which was uh, trapped with a plastic strap, um, and this is covering two years. Over the two years, we saw him multiple times, or heard multiple times, at the Shark Reef Marine Reserve. They come back, they used to come back. And uh, so we can see the progression of, of what's happening to that shark. And so it had this strap, this plastic strap, which was severely embedded into the gills and, and uh, sort of cutting off also one of the fins almost, 
for more than two years. And after two years, it showed up without uh, the plastic strap. On the other hand, you see um, a really interesting piece of, 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 uh, of information is, um, so many people think sharks don't get cancer. This is, of course, not true. They do get cancer. You see one here, for example. So this is an individual we turned up um, on Shark Reef Marine Reserve on one day, and we saw in A and B uh, this little protrusion. This wasn't really visible what it was, and over the course of two, three years, this developed into, into proliferation, which was really visible, as you can see on, on panel D, for example. Um, so, by using this direct observation and having people like David and Jen on the water taking pictures, sharing these pictures with us, um, is giving us a lot of information on, on the behavior of these sharks, of these species, on their well-being, um, and also, of course, a lot of information about what measures one needs to implement and develop together with communities so to protect these, uh, these areas. That's it in a nutshell. It really sounds as if photos and indeed citizen science and videos that are made by both professionals and amateurs are really part of this toolbox that you have access to uh, to support your work as a scientist. Um, Jen, you alluded to, to this a little bit earlier, this relationship between the scientists and the photographers. Can I ask you to comment as well a little bit? We. Well, I came to storytelling through science, right? So I have the re I used to study sturgeons. I'm on a sturgeon mm -hmm. story now, 27 species all over the world. And I know, I learned very quickly the power of imagery or videography, the power to be able to share with a funder, you know, grant, you know, people who do the, the issue the grants or I guess you just call them stakeholders. Yes. And so working with scientists, it helps us in storytelling too. It comes back to us. Not only can we provide the scientist imagery like he is using and, and incorporating, it helps us to come back and share with people some of the positive things that are happening. Yeah. Because there is so much negative out there, it can be, it can be unbearable, mm. unbearable. Mm. And you think what, you know, you just think it's too much, why, you know, why get out of bed, why bother, why donate to that particular platform? But there are really good things happening and it really is working with scientists, we get to tell their stories yeah. and to not just inspire people to keep supporting and to contributing in any way they can, but also to inspire other people into science and become a part of this. And look what you can, yeah, to look, to, there's a hundred different ways to become involved. And we want to inspire a hundred different, you know, inspire them a hundred different ways. So it's, it's inspiring. It can be positive. It can be negative. It can be powerful. And David, earlier you used the, the word magic. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the photos themselves and the photographic process. Can you tell us how do you go about taking some of these pictures and actually capturing that on camera? <laughs> well, for instance, uh, the pictures that are made that are half in, half out of the water require a very large front element of the underwater housing called a dome. Think about it, a big salad bowl, but a very expensive salad bowl. And behind that, you have an extreme wide angle lens. Mm -hmm. You are on the surface. The surface is going across the front of the, front of the uh, dome and you light the animal below or the, or the uh, scene below and you let the natural light on the other half balance out. To find these images is difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's just a particular there, but on a whole point of view, photography, underwater photography, Jennifer and I, is based upon this particular philosophy is that pictures, pictures have power and they have the power to humiliate, they have the power to educate, they certainly have the power to illuminate, they have the power the power to open people's eyes to the sea. Uh, you know, this is our water planet, and yet, for the most part, we don't realize that in how we see our lives. So it's very, very important as, as we go forward, 
especially in terms of how the planet is changing, these pictures are the, have to have the power to convince the unconvinced. And that's, what the, that's what one of the things we need to be able to produce. All pictures, uh, if they are to be workable, if they are to affect something, have to have that sense of grace and motion. And that's what the joy of photography is all about, and possibly the goal. I see. So that's what, that's what makes a great photo. Um, is there a single photo that perhaps stands out for you, one that you particularly like or remember? You're going to say it, aren't you? He's going to say it. What am I going to say? No, I'm not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to read there's your a story there, I'm <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. You know, there's always a lot of photos that I, I make that have, uh, have that kind of uh, heart-rendering <clears throat> moment for me, but pictures of a circle of barracuda in New Guinea, uh, pictures that I've made that have sort of longer legs. Mm -hmm. But you know... Tell us, tell us, know, it's on the tip yeah. of your tongue. But, you know, there's, people say, what is the most important photograph ever made? And, and a lot of people will say the most important photograph ever made in the history of photography is the picture taken of, uh, of the moon and Earth in the background called Earthrise by Bill Anders from Apollo 8. That's, a, that's the most important picture. It's not. <laughs> the most important picture is the picture you take of your family, your wife, your children, your pets, uh, your Porsche if you have one. <laughs> uh, your story. Your story. Pictures are so important. Uh, they are so, these personal pictures are so important that when a, a tornado levels a home that you've had your life in, what people search for after they look for the pets and the children, you know, the errant children, but after that, they look for these pictures. Pictures are who we are. Uh, and in science, that makes the difference. We are going into a world where we're chasing the farthest end of light by the CERN Collider, by the Hubble Telescope, where light is going to become, as far as we can look back, time. And right here in this, in this room and places, you will be doing that. You will be chasing who we are and what we are on this planet. Very good. I think that's a very good point to bring our audience in and see if we have any questions. There's uh, microphones around the room, at least one of them over here. Yes, exactly. Um, so could you please, um, if you do have a question, and I hope that you do, um, just introduce yourself, tell us who you are, so we know who we're talking to. And yes, are we ready? Ladies? There's Good, all right. Let's start with this one over here. The lady right here in the front, and then the lady right there in the back. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Miriam Walker. I'm also a biologist working in sustainable development. And you were talking about, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. It was very inspiring. And you were talking about convincing the unconvinced. And I often have this challenge in my job. And I wonder <laughs> if you have a magic answer to this with your pictures maybe, or what is the narrative that really con is convincing people that are not in our bubble, people that we have to convince still? Right, so how do we convince the skeptics? Who wants to take this? Maybe Jörg? Well, I mean, how to convince the skeptics? So I think, I mean, many of the things you, you cover with your photography and, uh, and, and also you have looked at shark fisheries, uh, you can take any fishery. So one of the big threats, obviously, of, of the ocean today and sharks in particular, but many other species too, is really fishing, large-scale fishing. 
Um, and, and some of these individuals which are fished heavily um, or species, they come with a bad reputation like sharks in, in many cases. So I think, I mean, people generally, they, they, you can do a lot of science about these, these, these species. Why do they do this and why is it interesting, blah, blah, blah. That really doesn't convince people on the street, I guess. Um, there is a saying, and, and many people say this, that uh, you, you protect what you love. And I think pictures are really powerful, as you said, David, um, in, in sort of conveying that message of, of magic. When you see, of course, the best what can happen is when you see this life on the water, when you encounter an animal like the crocodile on the water. Then you really, I mean, this doesn't leave you untouched in whatever way. Um, and, and when you see the beauty, and this is also why I think it's super important and crucial to actually document over time, going back 50 years, as long as you can, mm. to set the baseline. Because what we see today when we dive in the ocean or in the lake is not what it used to be. We all know that. But when we see it, this is really changing the story. Because seeing is sort of understanding, and it's a very different world, so to speak, from just knowing and reading that it used to be different. Yeah. So I think in that sense, it's, it's absolute, absolutely important that people, be professionals, be it citizen scientists, document the state of the world as many times, any second, basically. I like that. Seeing is understanding. Uh, Jen? I can give her a quick example. Mm -hmm. of. Um, so we speak on tour for National Geographic Live. It's a series that you speak in, I don't know, we've spoken in hundreds of cities and numbers of countries, and it's a 70-minute presentation. In, in one of our communities, this is where you get, it's where you do this, this feedback one-on-one, -on -one, right? And we gave mm -hmm. one in our own community, and what I liked best about that was the leaders in the community, the, how do I say this, uh, the commercial, the people who were in the commercial businesses came to us, bankers. I can think of one specific. He said, would you come and give a corporate talk? What you and David presented here in this national, you didn't hit us over the head with a baseball bat. You didn't tell us you were causing it, that we're all at fault, who was at fault and why, and do a lot of screaming and jumping up and down. We simply showed the before and afters, mm -hmm. coral through the lens of time. Mm -hmm. We don't, and we say what causes it. We don't say who caused it, what, whatever. We just show what is happening or with the harp seals. And what Cyril did, Cyril came up and he said, would you ever speak at our corporate banking meeting in New York City? Because this is, a, this is a series that we can listen to without assuming, without blaming. And it's a way I was really happy to hear that because then you're getting invited into the corporate world, which is outside of our bubble, by the way, like by a, you know, by a billion light years. So I'm excited to get inside a corporate bubble. And you do that if you just tell, bring all the voices to the story, every voice, even some voices you don't, you might not be comfortable with. And I felt that was a victory. That was a real victory. That's great. And there may be some bankers in Zurich too. I, I don't know. <laughs> Is that what's happening here? <laughs> Very good, thank you. There was a question at the back there. Yes, right there. Go ahead, please. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I think your talk was really inspiring, helpful, and also made me cry a little bit. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> um, I'm Divina. I'm doing my master's on phytoplankton at EOVAC, <laughs> and also passionate diver and photographer. So big fan. <laughs> Um, my question is a bit more specific. So it's about the, uh, the project on the coral spawning. Um, I was just wondering about the success rate of this project and also whether the zoo anxelet, uh, they come back and yeah, they can form the symbiosis again, I think. That's my question. There, there is an entire backstory to this that you need 
to hear about. We had 20 minutes that we turned into like 27 and a half <laughs> minutes, in case you didn't notice that. <laughs> and so in Peter Harrison's case, he's got a slew of PhD students. They're working on super LG. They're working on how to boost LG when, and they're, lear lear they're learning how to implant LG back into the coral. I will give you a card. You need to connect to these people to learn about all of this plankton. It's incredible what they're doing. You ask about the success rate. He had a pilot study in the Philippines he started before he went and got millions of dollars worth of grant money for the Great Barrier Reef. His pilot project now is it was six, it's probably nine or 10 years old. And they go back every April and they measure these corals that they planted exactly like you saw and they're reestablishing the reef, which is what gave the man confidence mm. to go to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Power or the Re Marine Authority, Grumpa, and granting, society, you know, granting agencies to say, I not only propose this, but look at what's happening in the Philippines. Look at my pilot study. And so that's what gave him a foundation. But I, I have a card, and it would be great. I can give you this for contact. And what there's this whole there's this whole layer of research behind what he's doing about, you know, literally about how to enhance and, and do all of this incredible work. It's, it, yeah, you might be interested in it. Jörg, you want to add something? I mean, sometimes it's really hard to, when you just look at one project to, to measure success or say, is it successful or not? Um, because, I mean, as we saw, reefs in particular, but also forests, they're really complex systems. So this is not easy. This is, this is really complex. Um, and so if you just focus on the corals, which you have to, or sharks or whatever, you're just looking at one piece. Uh, so, and so this is really on, important to understand when you measure the success over time in, in particular, because it may look like a success in this year, mm. but it may be different in 10 years from now. So it's really long term, or depending on, on what time scale you look at. Um, and when I briefly introduced the, uh, the Shark Project uh, Marine Reserve is that um, we're just using the sharks because you have great pictures of sharks and because they resonate with many people. But behind this is, of course, protecting the reef, the environment. Because without a functioning reef, you don't have sharks. Without sharks, you don't have corals. So it's, it's really complex. And, uh, and one needs to keep this in mind. But of course, you need to... You, you need to show success in, in, in certain stages. Uh, this is important. And also document successes, uh, but never, you know, it's always very complex when it comes to biology and, and life. And you bring up a good point. So coral bleaching is what decimated the reef. But in the Philippines, you're subject to cyclones. And they can wipe out. A, it's, it comes from every single direction. So this reestablished reef could suffer the fate of a wipeout of another kind. It is long term. Mm. It's a long term. How is he doing this? He's literally looking at the mech. Does this work to produce that? But it's subject to a thousand perils mm. and change at any time. We need long term thinking, but on the short term, we're getting very close to the end of our hour. Can I take one final question from the audience, please? Lady right over here. The microphone is on its way to you. Right here, in the middle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lilia. I'm a climate researcher here at ETH. So I deal more with the future than the past, <laughs> what we could be seeing. And I'm also a diver. I have, a, unfortunately, a camera floating somewhere in Raja Ampat. <laughs> <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyways, I wanted to ask a bit how you see your storylines combining with what we might potentially be seeing. I mean, my is maybe quite far. I go all the way to 2100, but uh, even just a decade or so. Foresight, forward thinking. What's coming? Ooh la la, that's a tough question. Ooh la la. Hmm. Um, can, can we do another session just on that? Yeah. Yeah. I can say what I'm trying to do. What's important for our future, David, right, David and I right now, and I, and I won't speak for you, but I'm saying something we combine forces to do. It's time, it's time to put people in front of us and on our shoulders. 
It's time for us to get people where they need to be. It's time for us to support other projects. And one of our projects is going to the next generation. And every single National Geographic meeting we're in, give or take, that's an exaggeration, but a lot of them, it's, we do talk about the next generation and how substantial they will be in the solutions and the problem solving. But what's never in those meetings are the next generation or their voices or themselves. So we are, we are literally submerging, we're looking for programs and submerging with, with programs and next generation um, scientists of any sort, giving them a voice and giving them a platform and taking that around the world. I didn't share it here, but we, we literally do these segments and one was the scuba knots who are doing coral work in uh, Florida. It's a Florida, it's a Southern US program. And these are ages 14 to 19. We submerged with them, we barely kept up. They're making a huge impact, but we, we film them, photograph them. Our voice doesn't appear in the piece at all. It's theirs, they own it. Then we share that. And that inspires other of their age or the next, you know, and we, that's where we're going in the future is trying to give them, just put some shine on what they're working to inspire them to keep going. Number one, to inspire other ones to other people to, to, to enter these, these areas that where we need the help. And, and we're also looking for other programs. So if you know about programs we need to know about, we want to chase them and we want to submerge with them, and we want to give them a voice. That's how we're looking into the future. We've talked a lifetime. We have talked a lifetime, and we have published stories for a lifetime. David's on his 80th at Nat Geo, and I'm, you know, and I've been there since 2000, and it's time to, it's time to push other people forward that are going to be at it for the next five, you know, five decades, or, you know, literally that long. Give them the platform. Jörg, how do you look into the future? Well, I mean, what's coming, it really depends. Um, and to use that example from Fiji again is, as I said, we have been working there for 20 years, more than 20 years. So we, and that the reef was essentially wiped out. There wasn't many corals left, nothing. So this came back slowly over time when fishing stopped. Then came COVID. Fiji was closed entirely for one and a half years. People suffered. So what they did is, Going back after one and a half years to Fiji, seeing it again was devastating. Mm. It was fished out again. Everything was cleaned out. Everything. Everything you can eat, which was bigger than this. So these people, they had no income. Fiji is very different from what we used to know here, of course, but uh, they had no income. So they had to go fish and, and, you know, to live, to survive. So it really depends. Those things you can't, plan, you can't plan for. Nobody was really looking at this. Of course, working with communities is super important. We do this. We try to bring on um, young people to, to become marine scientists, go to USP, study marine biology. That you can control to some extent, but you can't control everything. Mm. And, and in, some times, in, in some cases, this is really devastating. And it, it puts you back years and years and years. Now, to not end on a, on a sad note, um, in the two years since, since sort of everything is sort of back to normal, um, it has recovered big time. Mm -hmm. And this also shows the strengths of these, of these systems. So, you know, this is resilient. This is, it may go down, it may look bad, but depending on the biology of the species, it can also recover pretty fast. Yeah. So I'm hopeful. Good. Build, building on what Jörg and Jen have just said, David, I want to give you the last word because here we are in Switzerland, a landlocked country, uh, the ocean matters may seem a little bit distant. In fact, they are. Um, what, what do you say to us who maybe, you know, are thinking about getting involved or, or what, what can we actually do from here? Well, just Switzerland may be the landlocked country, but it has given us some of the greatest, greatest sea scientists in the world, uh, the bathyscaphe was invented here. The diving tables, the new computer systems were invented here. Some of the, some of the best underwater photographers in the world come from a landlocked country called Switzerland. The one thing Switzerland does have, and plenty of, is you people and the genius that you have. So what is our future? 
where do we go from here? Well, one of the things is we look around. For instance, you have a, a, a project that's looking at plankton worldwide. You have citizen scientists spread out across the globe that are going into the sea at night and looking at the smallest things in the open ocean and communicating back and forth with each other. It's the new, it's the new type of photography that's actually quite old, but it now is, has come to vogue again, called black water photography at night in the open ocean. It's a bit scary. But the, but the things that we're photographing are small and tiny and incredibly, incredibly they are the, the lattice work of life in the sea. We fight against the most dangerous of all impo opponents, and that is, in Jennifer's word, apathy. Mm. And that's what we must conquer. And we do that by showing people what a glorious place this planet can be through photography, through science, through writing, through poetry, through art, through ourselves. These are really important things. We protect whales. One of the great reasons why we protect whales is almost a universal need, is because we've seen pictures of whales and what they actually look like. Those are the things that photography can do. Those are the things that people who are committed can do and photography is one of the great tools. Um, as far as the ocean goes, as Jennifer and I say, as the oceans go, so do we. This is our key, this is our life, this is our planet, and the greatest show on Earth is Earth, is Earth itself. Very nicely put. Thank you so much, all three of you. Uh, we only managed to scratch the ocean's surface um, tonight. Uh, the official wording of SDG 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's seas and marine resources for sustainable development. Now, we may not have found all of the solutions uh, to conserving our oceans today, but we've conversed and we've been inspired by fantastic panelists. Uh, I hope you all agree it's been a wonderful conversation based on wonderful images. Um, please join me in thanking also everyone who was involved in organizing tonight's event. And uh, the next global lecture, if you're interested in saving the date, is on October 23rd. It will be with Kim Stanley Robinson, who uh, is the author of The Ministry of the Future. Um, I hope to see you there, and in the meantime, let us continue the discussion in the apéro that awaits us outside the Audimax. I thank you very much. <laughs>